Today, we're going to talk about houses. Regardless of whether you live in a mansion, a two-story home, a one-story, an apartment, a structure that you're building, a tiny house, or a cave, whatever it is will have a certain type of style. So with that in mind, here now are the 20 coolest looking traditional houses around the world. Number 20. The Trulli of Alborobello. We're going to start in Italy, which is rather poetic because they're known for all sorts of styles of buildings and structures, from various renaissances to empires and even enlightened periods of history. In this case, we're going to Alborobello, where you can find some very unique traditional types of homes known as Trulli. And if you're wondering what kind of house they are, they're a drywall construction, a prehistoric building technique that's still in use in this region of Italy. The Trulli are made up roughly of worked limestone boulders that are collected from neighboring fields, and characteristically, they feature pyramid-type domed or conical roofs that are built up of corbelled limestone slabs. And as you can see, people are more than happy with putting multiple kinds of this right next to another, bringing together a rather unique visual. In some areas of Italy, you'll even find about 1,500 of these kinds of houses all scrunched up together. What may be surprising, though, is that the roofs were more than just a standard kind of thing. Within these roofs were religious markings that were inscribed to try and ward off evil spirits, bad luck, and more which is definitely not something that you hear about every single day. Now, while obviously this kind of construction was passed on by the other, more modern style, they are still found today because of UNESCO. They made the main area that featured these houses a World Heritage Site, which means that they'll be preserved for many years to come. And that's important because this kind of traditional house is still really cool and a unique way of building a home. Plus, you just never know. This kind of style may be become popular again in the future especially with how much it costs to build a regular house these days. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Now it's time for the fancy topic. The picture in today's fancy topic will more than likely cause damage to your eyeballs. Because as you can see, this is a totally realistic photo, which showcases a house being built into a rock where someone will no doubt totally live in it. Now, allegedly this picture comes from Africa and there are people or civilizations there that are said to live in these kind of rock homes all the time. First of all, no, they do not. And secondly, the picture is clearly fake in all of the ways that matter. And thirdly, even if people from Africa or other parts of the world did want to live in a rock house like this, the opportunity to do so would be quite limited. To be clear, there are houses that are either comprised of rocks or built into a place like a cliff face. We've seen them with our own eyes, and even featured them in past videos here on the Fancy Banana. But the difference between those and this picture, outside of them being fake, is that they were carefully built to be part of the rock face or the cliff. As you can see in this photo, there's no clear way up to that house, and I highly doubt that anyone would have been able to dig that deep into the rock and carve out a space for people to go through it. That's just way too much work, and it could hurt the integrity of the rock itself. Not to mention, if you did have the money to be able to build a nice house in Africa, why would you do it in the side of a rock? Do you really think that nothing could reach you there? If anything, people would want to break in just to see what it's like. As always, you can comment down below using the hashtag FancyTopic and let me know your opinion in relation to what I just showed you on the screen. Number 19. Turf Houses Now we'll move on from very fake houses to very real ones which exist in Iceland. While many people thought that Iceland was, well, covered in ice at one time, that wasn't proven to be true at all. It is actually really beautiful there. And they have epic hot springs that you should check out if you have the chance. One of the reasons that the people of Iceland were able to survive for so long before modern advances in construction were because of turf houses. Long story short, Iceland was once covered in a lot of trees, but when the Vikings and other settlers from Norway came around, they then cut them all down and suddenly they didn't have enough timber to make a wooden roof. 
So what were they going to do in order to stay warm and keep their houses insulated? Well, it was simple. They straight up used that grass and dirt and turned it into their roofs. Get it? The turf house. Not only did the turf offer premium insulation exceeding wood or stone, but it was also much easier to come by, and this resulted in almost every single farm in Iceland being made up of turf houses. One of the great ironies of this style was that it made families that lived in the home more sociable, because they would be able to focus on construction, having one great hall where at night the family could come together and they would light a singular fire in order to stay warm, and they would bond as they kept them cozy. They would also eat, socialize, and even sleep in that one room so that they didn't have to worry about the rest of the house being potentially cold. By 1890, 87% of the country was living in these kind of homes, and eventually they were able to make more modern ones, but these days, many of those turf houses do still exist. Number 18. Cave Houses Now I told you previously that there are plenty of homes that are either carved out of a rock or attached to them in one way or another, and now I'm going to show you an example of that with the cave houses that were made in modern-day Turkey once upon a time. The idea of living in caves is primal in origin. After all, we call those early humans cavemen, but this is another level of cave living altogether. The people were able to dig into the caves and build homes for themselves in the Neolithic era, which is around 3000 BCE, if not before then. But why would people try and live in a cave versus a kind of house? It seems almost too primitive, and the answer lies in how the region in that point of history was filled up with war. That window? These windows, probably original, probably not. Many people retreated to this area and then worked together in order to build a place where they could take refuge. And if you think about it from afar, you wouldn't be able to tell that there were people living in caves unless you actually saw one. Even if you got close, the people were clever enough to dig tunnels into the ground, connecting their homes and helping to protect each other. Sometimes it's just about using what you have at hand to get the home that you feel safe in. Fast forward to today, and you can still see these homes. They are quite impressive. Just the effort that was needed to make all of it work would have been astronomical, and yet they somehow did it, because they wanted to be safe and not dragged into a conflict. Something that we can all relate to on some level. Number 17. Yurts what is one of the biggest problems with owning a home? Well, once you own that home, you're kind of stuck in the place that you are. And if you want to move somewhere else, it can be a hassle of a process to find a new property and find someone to buy the one you have and go through all the paperwork and all of that kind of stuff with an agent and an agency and loans and whatever else in order to get it all done. However, in the days long past, people got around by making things called yurts. These were basically a higher-end kind of tent that was comfortable, a good size, and could be moved with relative ease should the people need to move to a new location. Yurts can take anywhere between 30 minutes and 3 hours to set up or take down, and usually they're between 5 and 15 people. As they say, a lot of hands make light work. When everything is set up, there's a chimney in the middle providing heat to the house, and there are carpets that are placed all over the place so that everyone's not on the dirt. And there's even a door that helps cement that home kind of feeling. Unlike a tent though, the entire thing is not comprised of fabric, as that wouldn't stay upright. Instead, it's made out of a mixture of things like fabric, wool, and wood. Ropes are also used to hold everything in place. Yurts are most popular in Central Asia and are typically used by nomadic tribes that had to move around a lot. And you can see the appeal of having a literal mobile home that you can set up anywhere versus having to continually build a fully fledged house once you've moved to a new place. Because of their design, they could be easily fixed and repaired or have certain parts replaced when they were worn out. Number 16. Ruma Gadang In Indonesia, this translates to big house, so you can kind of guess how I'm about to approach it. When you look at these pictures, the people who make these houses ensure that they stand out from the crowd because that's a whole lot of spikes to put into a roof. 
Ironically, you would usually see those kind of things on spiked slopes in places like temples or other impressively sized buildings, but these homes were meant to be those for the common person, just with very uncommon roofs. Apparently, the roof was designed in such a way to be able to reach out to God, which would fit when you consider certain nations' beliefs and rituals. In West Sumatra, for example, one of these homes reflects the province's people and has become the symbol of West Sumatra and the culture. And you do have to admit, it's a rather pretty home to look at once you get over that roof shape. For example, if you look at the materials that make up the house, they are rather intricate and beautifully designed. There are many people who would love that kind of artistic look for their own homes, and what may also surprise you is the size of the homes themselves. They're meant to be long and rectangular buildings that can house numerous people and still fit in some guests. Typically, the women of the household would have their own room, and if more people needed to be there, they would either build smaller houses around the main one or simply build onto the house to make it even bigger. Number 15. Chalets an important thing about homes isn't just that they're meant to house a group of people, but they're also meant to be a port in a storm, if you will, due to conditions that some people live in. Amazing home. Let's go inside. And for those who lived in the mountainous areas of the world, like the Alps, you'll find homes known as chalets far and wide. If you go to certain mountains across the world, you will find these that are full-on homes to people and sometimes even a luxury getaway place for others. But in their earlier days of creation, they served a simple purpose, and that was to keep the herders warm. You see, back when herding was a bit more hands-on, the people of the Western Alps would have to follow the herd as they went up into the mountains to get certain things. That also meant being exposed to the elements over and over and over again. And so, tending to these herds, they would have to stay safe. After many years of doing this, chalets eventually became the modern amenities that you see now. And some people forgot that they were once just a very practical home. Number 14. Pueblo Homes now we're going to head to the United States where we're taking a deep dive into the Native American tribes that made homes out of very basic materials and yet they still stand to this day. The Pueblo tribe live in the southwestern side of the United States and to make their rather sizable homes, they used materials that were all around them. In this case, things like adobe and stone. Adobe was the primary thing they used, but rocks were also used when available. And one thing to note is that the Pueblo believed that, like people, their homes were a key part of the universe and they had a finite lifespan. And that's why they built them so carefully and attempted to tend to them whenever possible so that the houses could have a good life. Unlike modern day homes, while Pueblo homes had upper levels, you couldn't reach them via the stairs. Instead, there were ladders that would help you to get from one part of the house to another. This method of construction became so popular that other people and cultures used it for quite some time, and many of these homes and buildings remain to this day. Number 13. Anne Hathaway's Cottage when many people think of William Shakespeare, they may not often think of him as having a wife. However, his wife, Anne Hathaway, had a cottage that she lived in as a child, and it can still be found today. It was a rather spacious home with 12 rooms, and these days it has numerous gardens that surround it. Ironically, after many owners and issues, the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, which is totally a real thing, bought the home and helped to restore it to its original standing, likely in honor of his late wife. That went double for when the home was burnt up in a fire, and they perfectly restored it afterwards. Fast forward to now, and you can explore this cottage as a museum and see where the lady who had captured Shakespeare's heart had once lived. Number 12. Old Oya Houses Old Oya houses consist of a group of renovated caves and sea captains' homes. There are three studios, three cave homes, and two Venetian-style suites. So, you know, if you want variety, well, they certainly have it. They're situated in the center of a village that overlooks the caldera and is part of the original settlement that was rebuilt in 1991. While they might not look like much compared to some other homes that you've seen so far, these honestly, it's kind of the point. 
The people who helped to rebuild the area, which was partially destroyed thanks to an earthquake in the 1950s, wanted to create and recreate a space that would adhere to what had come before. Plus, they wanted those who came to visit the houses and the location in general to feel comfortable and also enjoy the natural beauty that was all around them. Sometimes that also means keeping things a bit more simple and not adhering to certain modern ideas and designs. And when you look at some of the pictures of the place and the luxurious yet simplistic feel to it all, you may just get the urge to try these homes out for yourself. Number 11. The Half-Timbered House When you look at these houses, you can totally see why they're called that. The timber is very visible, but so are the other construction materials. Much like with other homes on this list, the half-timbered homes were built out of a necessity in order to battle the cold conditions they were in. Once they were made, they were then used for quite some time, and you can still see them in parts of Germany even today. One of the defining characteristics of the half-timbered homes are the unique ways in which the beams were designed. They do sometimes create clever designs that people have been drawn to over the years. As for the other half of the half-timbered homes, that would be clay and stone, which obviously works great as insulators for the warmth that they were trying to keep. Plus, they designed the homes in such a way that it would reduce the spread of fire from one part of the home to the next. Number 10. Minka. Now we move on to a home that honestly looks pretty cozy, and that's partially why Minka translates to House of the People, because it was designed by the people of Japan during the Edo period to be a nice and comfortable living space for families. In fact, Minka were the dwellings of farmers, artisans, and merchants, and one of the ironies of this is that nowadays, it can mean virtually any kind of Japanese-style house. During the peak in popularity, in times like the Edo period, many people made Minka houses and then adapted them to the specific parts of Japan in which they lived, such as making them adhere to climate conditions. Typically, the roof featured a very big slope, and the interior was much more cool and dry because of it, even in the summer and during the heavy rains. The people of Japan have always been known to make things that work, and this is no exception. Number 9. Cortillo Now we head to Spain to look at their rural dwelling known as the Cortillo. The irony is that this design technically did not come from the Spanish, but was likely associated with Romans, as their villas had very similar designs. A cortillo would usually include a large house, together with accessory buildings, such as workers' quarters, sheds to house the livestock, granaries, oil mills, barns, and more. And often, they even featured a wall that limited the enclosure where there were no buildings surrounding it. In fact, some of them even featured chapels because, you know, they had to get to church on time. Depending on the area that the cortillo is in, it could be a vast expanse that was full of agriculture or an isolated area where you wouldn't find other people for miles around. Number 8. Hanok Now we go to a place you may not have been expecting, Korea. Given the divide between the two nations and the troubled history they've had as a result, you may not think that any traditional housing would be prevalent or even relevant today. However, that's not exactly true. The Hanak was a style of home so prominent that it actually became the standard kind of home within the nation since the 14th century. which was when one of their dynasties was going on. Korean architecture considers the positioning of the house in relation to its surroundings with the thought given to the land and the seasons. The interior of the home is also planned accordingly. That shows incredible discipline and desire to have things to be just so. And unsurprisingly, like with the Japanese minkas, the differences in the home's shape and look depend on the region. Not surprising though, north and south parts of Korea had very different looks to their homes. Number 7. Log Cabins Now here we have a classic style of home that everyone should be familiar with, especially since log cabins are something that can be found in the world and are likely to be used for many generations to come. 
But where did log cabins originate? Well, while they have had a long history, it was Scandinavia that actually popularized the log cabin and brought it to the rest of Europe and then eventually to the rest of the world. The beauty of this kind of home is that as long as you have trees to cut down, well, you can make a log cabin quite easily. Plus, as many have noted, they can last in any season and can be an incredibly comfortable home to live in, even in the winter months. And that's why they were popular then, and they're still popular now. Number 6. A Canal House Heading to the Netherlands, we're going to take a look at a very unique design called the Canal House. Yes, they are indeed houses that are built upon canals, but they're also a bit more clever than that. You see, when they were built back in the 1600s, they were not exactly designed for people to just live and be happy in. This was during a time where the Dutch were trying to build and sell at a rapid fire pace, which is why these houses are so tall and thin. The smaller they are, the more houses you could make. And originally, they were not meant to be full-on houses. They were going to be business centers, storage areas, combined residences and such. It would not be until much later that they eventually got the true house moniker that continues to this day. Just goes to show that with all things, even houses can evolve. Number 5. Stilt Houses this next style of house is one that you can find in numerous countries all over the world, showing that people can sometimes have the same idea when the right circumstances are plaguing them. In this case, a stilt house is exactly what it sounds like. It's a house elevated off of the ground and sitting on stilts. How high and by what can sometimes vary due to the location, but the intention is always the same. The goal is to raise the house up so that nearby waters won't be able to damage or wash away the home should the tides rise or a flood come in. And I'm not kidding when I said these houses are everywhere. You can find examples of them in the Indo-Pacific, Europe, the Americas, Africa, coastlines all over the place, and more. And it's a simple and yet effective way to keep your house from being flooded, and you can also technically keep out pesky animals like rats from crawling into your home. Number 4. Ranch Style House I have to be clear here, I'm not talking about a ranch in terms of the wide open area with one home on a property that's owned by a person or a family. I'm talking about a style that was made popular in the United States that boomed during the Second World War. The notion of this home was to create a low to the ground yet wide open space for families to be comfortable in and happily live their lives. As the style would grow within the country, other nations took a liking to it and then expanded upon it themselves. This style did lose popularity, but you can still find many examples of them scattered about if you know where to look. Number 3. Queenslander for this next home, we will head down under to Australia. The Queenslander is another type of raised home, but this one has evolved over the years to be a bit more about the aesthetics versus the defined purpose. It was popular in the nation before the period of World War II. In fact, the first one was even said to have been built in 1850. When it was constructed in that initial period, it was yet another home that was built to handle the harsh climates that Australia threw its way. The house was designed to be practical and had verandas in order to help keep the house warm or cool, keep the air flowing through, and also allow people to be outside and enjoy their day without having to fully leave their home. Number 2. Havali these grand residences showcase intricate architecture and often feature courtyards, balconies, and decorative elements. Usually, they're constructed out of local materials and represent the cultural and artistic heritage of regions in India. <sighs> These opulent structures have served as homes for wealthy families and also played crucial roles in social and cultural gatherings. They're known for their exquisite frescoes, detailed carvings, and vibrant colors, and today, some of them have even been converted into heritage hotels or museums, which offer visitors a glimpse into the historical and architectural richness of Indian craftsmanship. Said to have originated in India, the Havali is meant to be a kind of mansion or manor for a whole lot of people to live in. 
and they definitely have the room to keep a large family and their guests there. Outside of being a living area, it could also be used for massive gatherings or even rituals, but one of the key elements to this place was the privacy that it could provide. There were numerous partitions and places that could be put into use so that men and women, or even smaller groups of people in general, could be able to do the things they do and still have privacy. These dwellings are also known to be rather lavish, which includes having fountains within their courtyard. Yards. Number 1. Riyadh Finally, we head to Morocco where they have the Riyadh. Ironically, it was not a house initially, it was a kind of garden or courtyard. And then eventually, it became the type of place that the nation is most associated with. Alleys are these Riyadhs, the peace and quiet. A Riyadh is a fully enclosed place that's insulated with high-strength, neutral walls, and it features minimal vents to keep out heat and street noise. The last part is something that I'm sure that many of us would appreciate in our own homes. The concept of the Riyadh is from multiple cultures, and they've been so effective and useful over the years that even with modern advances, they still make them today. Albeit, they do much fancier ones with greater luxuries. They're a big hit with tourists that come to the country as well. The intricate structures will often feature tile work, carved wood, and central fountains. They provide an oasis of calm within the bustling old city quarters, and they're typically characterized by inward-facing designs. They shield residents from the noise of the street, and many of them have been converted into boutique hotels these days, offering visitors a glimpse into Moroccan architecture and cultural heritage. Visitors will experience a serene escape while also being able to immerse themselves in the rich history and aesthetics of Moroccan design. This makes them a popular choice for accommodations in many places all across Morocco. In the end, Riyadh's become an excellent blending of historic charm with modern comforts in the heart of many Moroccan cities today. Well, that's all from the realm of homes and the ones that really stand out from the crowd. Which of these traditional houses did you find to be the most interesting? And would you want to live in some of them if you were given the chance? Perhaps you know of another traditional style of home that you feel could have made it onto this list. You should be sure to let me know all about it in the comments section down below. Check out the other cool things that are showing up on the screen, and I will see you next time.